Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite you all to our discussion session, a more in-depth discussion of the talk we heard yesterday from Dr. Elise Krauf. And um, as part of the Inference Colloquium series, as many of you know, we have these two events. We have the talk followed by a more open discussion um, with the issues that were raised in the talk. And yesterday, Dr. Quell talked to us about causal ordering, and in particular, the many thorny issues that come together when one is trying to understand quantum entanglement and the role of causal ordering in um, understanding quantum mechanics more generally. And she presented some new ideas uh, new um, new avenues that she's been thinking about on um, on this problem, and it gives me great pleasure today that our discussant and conversant with her, um, we have uh, Professor Yamima uh, Ben Menahem from the Department of Philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Yamima Ben uh, Menahem is the Barbara Drus Dibner Professor of the History of Science Emeritus at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Jewish Thought at Shalem College. Uh, Professor Ben Menahem, to those of you who are uh, familiar with the uh, uh, intellectual currents in the philosophy of science would know that needs no introduction. She's one of the preeminent philosophers of science whose work has spanned causation, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, scientific realism, the role of contingency and necessity in history. So a real broad palette of really important and complex problems that she has worked on. Um, and so she is the perfect uh, conversant from whom we can learn a lot uh, about how to think about these sort of radical new ways that Elise presented yesterday for us to engage with the concept of uh, entanglement. Um, Professor Ben Menahem's recent book titled Causation in Science, published in 2018, is, is truly remarkable. So if anyone is looking for a primer to get to speed on matters of causation uh, in science more broadly, including the many open questions and debates, I highly recommend the book. And uh, before I turn the floor over uh, to Yamima, I would like to invite you and remind you all to keep your video switched off. And just a quick reminder on the format, we will cede the floor to Professor Ben Menahem, after which um, you know, Elise and she will engage with um, going through further points of clarification and debate and then we open up to the floor for a general Q&A. So without uh, further ado, um, I would like to turn it over to Yumima. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Priya, for this invitation. And thank you, Kai, um, and the people who are here with us. And um, I'm really grateful um, to Alice for introducing, and I suppose many of us are, um, for introducing us to really cutting edge thinking in the foundations and experimentation, in fund thinking and experimentation in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Um, actually, I won't be discussing a superposition of causal uh, states and processes that she presented to us to, uh, yesterday. But I want to step back a little bit and go back first to um, a few words about quantum mechanics and then step back even further and talk a little more about causation. So, Quantum mechanics is mind boggling, right? We all know that. And um, the price we have to pay, well, the benefits are enormous too because it's the most successful theory ever, but the intellectual price we have to pay seems to rise with every new generation of researchers looking into it. Because at the beginning, we only thought, okay, 
Schrodinger's function doesn't describe a wave in three-dimensional space. It's a probability wave. Okay, so maybe we have to give up determinism, but that's not such a high price. Um, but then it turned out that there are much more serious problems and um, one of them, and perhaps the most serious problem, as Elise noted yesterday, is the problem of um, entanglement. And the reason it is such an engaging problem and such a difficult problem is that it threatens to uh, get us into conflict with a the special theory of relativity, which no one really wants to give up. So. This is uh, the major problem. There are other problems, the measurement problem, other problems, and there are various solutions to it, and none of them completely satisfies everyone as yet. But I want to go back uh, for a minute to entanglement and how it came. I have to, I thought I was sharing this screen. So we have the uncertainty principle, and Einstein and, and his colleagues. Podolsky and Rosen was looking at this uncertainty principle, which gives us a kind of limit on what we can measure or how precisely we can prepare a system. But there was a camp in well, mainly the Copenhagen camp who said, no, this is a much more serious constraint. And it has a limit on um, not only on the precision that we can measure something, not only on the precision that we can prepare a system, but on the actual existence of these variables. And there are certain pairs of variables. And initially, um, and we here too, can talk about uh, position and momentum. So what was, and, and if we have only one particle and we're going to measure its position, how are we going to prove that it didn't have a momentum at the same time? We cannot do that because when we measure position as Heisenberg showed, we interfere with the momentum. And so we cannot prove that the uncertainty principle is really such a strong constraint on reality. So the ingenious idea was to take this uh, um, system and have two particles instead of one particle. And then at the beginning, they start from a position which we can signify designate by zero and zero momentum as well. And then there is some interaction that sends them into reverse directions. And now the story begins. We can either measure position and then the other party would know, and I'm specifically not specifying at the moment why, the other party would also know what position the particle is in, although no measurement was carried out on the other side, but we could also measure momentum and the other party would know. And since we didn't interfere with anything that the other party did, Einstein and colleagues concluded that both position and momentum exist. And the only limitation of the uncertainty principle is on measurement. Okay. Why do I go to that problem? I go back to that problem because already here, why? Why is it that we assume that the momentum of one particle has to be correlated with that of the other particle? Because there is a conservation law here. So already here, we touch on something that according to my approach, and I will say more about it later, is related to causality. Now, as thinking about that developed, a lot of things had to happen. First of all, here we have continuous variables and Bohm translated it into discrete variables, which would lead to measurement. Then famously Bell translated it or not translated it, but reformulated the problem when we don't only measure uh, variables in one direction, but we play around with the correlations in different directions, like three different spin measurements in different directions. And moreover, it turned out that we can send the, these particles. Initially, it turned out that in theory, we could do that. We can send these particles so far away in space-time that they are 
as we say, space-time related, and they cannot interact with one another according to the special theory of relativity. And then the correlation becomes really mysterious because how are we to explain that correlation? They cannot signal to one another because we saw to it that they are so far away. So the only other possibility is that there is a common cause to this correlation. The only other possibility, given our classical way of thinking, when we have correlation, then either one is a cause of the other or the other is a cause of the first, or if that cannot happen, if there cannot be a direct connection between the two, we are looking for a common cause for that correlation. And the big achievement of Bell's inequalities was to rule out the possibility of such a common cause. In this context, we call the common cause hidden variables because supposedly there are some additional variables that determine what would be the result of a measurement on each one of the particles in each one of the directions that we choose to measure. So, Instead of common cause, we are talking about hidden variables, but it amounts to the same thing. And so if there is no common cause, then we are back to the problem of correlation. So maybe they do signal to one another, but that would mean that we are, we are violating the special theory of relativity. So this is a big conundrum and as conundrums are sometimes solved, there is a distinction. These states can be correlated, but they cannot signal to one another. And this is a new idea because again, classically we would th think that the correlation lets us or allows us to infer from what happens to one, what happened to the other. But in this case, we say correlation, yes, Signaling, no. So it's a new way of understanding the correlation in order to save compatibility between quantum mechanics and the special theory of relativity. Now, the special theory of relativity, as you remember, is a causal theory in a very strong sense because there is a limitation on how causal signals, signals can travel they can travel at a certain speed, not faster than the speed of light. And therefore it is causality that divides space-time space into regions where events in those regions can interact with one another causally and regions that where events cannot inter interact with one another causally. And moreover, in those events, in those areas of space-time where there is no causal interaction, there is no well-defined temporal order. So just in parentheses, you remember Hume thought he could define causation in terms of temporal order, in terms of regularity, and it, in a way, special relativity reverses the order of that and says, we know what a causal signal is and how fast it can travel. And that will tell us in which areas of space time we can talk about a definite temporal order. But, um, so the problem of entanglement and the compatibility problem that it raises um, confronts us with, with two aspects of causation. One is, that it is conservation laws that explain for us the correlation. We don't want to violate certain conservation laws. And the other is that we worry about the conflict with a theory which is causal through and through in a very strong sense. And as I will proceed to explain, I don't think there is one sense to the notion of causation. But the theory of special relativity is a causal theory in a very strong sense. So what can be done about this? So a number of thinkers, um, I'm thinking primarily of you, Price, 
have come up, but he was not the first one and he is not the only one. And Haronov is an, has a nice formulation of quantum mechanics that is similar um, to what Price had in mind. And he's, you know, he's a physicist, not a philosopher. So instead of talking about particles and their correlations, we can, we can, we can um, think analogously about two twins. And there, are, this is again very familiar. It's not my translation into the, this scenario, but they are presented with a series of questions, and we find that their questions. So somewhere in their future, there is someone asking them these questions, and we find that their answers are more correlated than we would expect if they just answer randomly. And so we say, well, we have here some kind of correlation. It's not random. There must be some common cause. So probably the twins have a kind of genetic property that ensures their replying to certain questions in a certain way. Now, according to what we just said, Bell's inequalities and the whole problem of entanglement is that if we assume such a common cause or we assume such hidden variables, we get into conflict with quantum mechanics. And the violation of Bell's inequalities were confirmed by um, experience many, many times since the 80s. So if that's not a possibility, if we cannot go the left uh, uh, um, schema of a common cause to the correlation between the two twins, then you price says, why don't we go in the other direction and suppose that by asking these questions, the questioner causes or um, acts upon the twins, making them, giving them the property that will yield the correlation between them. So rather than looking for a common cause in the past, we look at something in the future that whose influence goes back and explains the correlation. So this, of course, is a very, very radical idea because we haven't encountered anything like retrocausation um, in our daily lives. And um, so this possibility sits there, and I, I want to ask later whether one takes it to be only an epistemic possibility. If we know what the answer was, we could go back and calculate probabilities, or if this is supposed to be something about physical reality. But anyway, it's a very radical solution. And uh, what we heard yesterday is certainly um, a kind of spin-off from that um, route uh, of, of that approach where we say, look, why are we so tied to the classical picture where the past influences the future, but the future never influences the past? Perhaps we should give up this assumption. So should we give up causal asymmetry or temporal asymmetry? Because the two are related. And as I said, sometimes we see causation as parasitic on temporal order, and sometimes it's the other way around as in special relativity, I think. And so according to Price, according to some other philosophers and According to uh, Elise yesterday, this is indeed a lesson which we should draw. And her approach wasn't based on uh, Price's argument or on retrocausality, but uh, was based on these very recent uh, arguments, theoretical arguments, and very recent experiments that seem to suggest. I, I want, I, I almost say demonstrate, but the, the experiment, but let me be very careful, seem to suggest that this is really a very fruitful approach to take. And I want to emphasize that the idea here to relinquish the causal order between past and future applies 
both according to price um, and according to a list, to the fundamental level of physics. And um, they do not, and, and there are other philosophers who have argued in their direction. And I think even Carlo Rovelli, in the first lecture of the series, which I listened to um, with great pleasure. Um, so we're talking about the fundamental level of physics and say here there is no temporal direction or no, or no causal direction. And the question of why we get the impression that there is such a thing on higher level is a very big question. And I think we should get to that question in the discussion. So this is one thing I want to note about yesterday's suggestion. And the other thing is more important because you see there was this argument for years and years and years that the fundamental laws of nature are time reversal symmetric. They don't distinguish, the fundamental laws of nature do not distinguish between past and future. No error of time at the fundamental level of physics. But I always felt that there was a gap in this argument and to conclude from the time reversal symmetry of the fundamental laws that there is no temporal order in individual processes seemed to me a big jump because it could be that all processes can go from one direction to the other and also from the other direction to the first. Like we can blow a balloon and fills up with air and then we, we deflate it. And it's again, this little piece of, of rubber and both can happen, but in each individual case, we could think supposedly in each individual case, we can say by pointing to initial conditions or whatever, we could say what the direction in this individual case was. So it seemed to me that there is a gap in the argument from time uh, reversal symmetry of the fundamental laws to no temporal order on the fundamental level or no causal order on the fundamental level. And what was what I found so fascinating about the results that Elisa represented yesterday was that here we're talking about individual processes. We're not rehearsing this older argument about the fundamental laws. And yet, we should note that the asymmetry in question is but one of the characteristics traditionally associated with the notion of cause. So even if we give up this asymmetry, this doesn't mean that we give up causation in general. So giving up the asymmetry of the causal relation, the temporal asymmetry of the causal relation, doesn't mean that we must give up the notion of cause. And here I get to my first question. So, into pause. <laughs> Imagine it's causation and Mark, Mark Twain speaking to you and the reports of the death of causation are greatly exaggerated on my view. So why is that? Can you hear me? Yeah. So here comes my first question. And it goes to you, Elise, but it goes to other people who have written about it. Are we talking about the principle of causality? I think you mentioned such a principle in your talk yesterday. Or are we talking about a concept, the concept of cause? And so just to show you that people confuse the two, and later in the discussion, discussion, maybe I could explain why. So here's Russell, the word cause is so inextricably bound up with misleading association as to make its complete extrusion from uh, the philosophical vocabulary desirable. And that is after criticizing the principle of causation. So he concludes no principle, no concept. And much more recently, John Norton, of course, says 
centuries of failed attempts to formulate a principle of causality, robustly true under the introduction of new scientific theories, have left the notion of causation so plastic that virtually any new science can be made to conform with it. So I think it's a big exaggeration. It's not so plastic. It's not so easy to construct a new theory that follows constraints that you wanted to, to follow or to satisfy. But what I point at here is a confusion between the principle and the notion. And um, I don't know what the principle of causality is um, in the sense that there are at least two formulations of the principle of causality and they are not synonymous and they're not even uh, co-extensional. So, but again, I skip that and I can answer, I can explain why I'm saying that later in the discussion. But anyway, I don't want to suppose that we endorse or uphold the principle of causality. What I do want to suppose or to propose, well, first, so now there are many definitions of causation. There is a vast philosophical literature. People are working on causation and whether it's a human definition, whether it's David Lewis's definition, whether it's a energy transfer, whether it's a probabilistic definition of causation, many competing definitions in the field, but they all refer to the causal relations between individual events. And each one has its problems and each one can be patched up but I don't want to follow this uh, well trodden route. What do I want to suggest? I suggest, I have suggested it already. I cannot pretend that it just occurred to me yesterday after Alice's talk. So I suggest looking instead at more general constraints, which in my view comprise the notion of cause. So what is a causal constraint in my view? A causal constraint is a constraint on change. It tells us which changes and processes are possible or even necessary. And now less important in my view, which changes are impossible. And um, if, if you go back to the philosophical literature about causation, for example, Woodward, interventions, this sort of thing, then they, they are often very good at explaining why something happened, but they are not so good at explaining why something didn't happen. And I think that in science, it's crucial for us when we think that something can happen, but we never find it. We never find two electrons in the same level. We want to know why. And it's a methodological principle that we should find a law or a constraint that excludes this option that we thought was possible, but we don't find it. And that's why I think uh, the language of causal constraints is much better to explain what doesn't happen. And I think it, it's crucial for science to think both about what happens and about what doesn't happen. So um, Yamima, I just have a quick clarification. So um, sure. a causal constraint then by this definition is intimately related to the idea of the counterfactual, right? Or mm. Um, it is, but you know, this is not the basis of the definition okay. because, because there are definitions of causation where they say a, a cause is a necessary condition, which means that if it hadn't happened, the effect wouldn't have happened. But I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying a conservation law is a causal constraint. Okay. Conservation okay. Energy is a causal constraint. So yes, if there wouldn't if we wouldn't have the conservation of energy, energy, we could build a perpetual mobile machine. So almost everything we say supports some counterfactuals. We say something positive and it supports some counterfactuals. And I'm for counterfactuals. I have no problem with counterfactuals even in history. But, but this is not the definition. This is not the defining characteristic. 
but perhaps we should we should pause for a moment on this notion of change because you know from antiquity philosophers have argued like Parmenides saying there is no change and Heraclitus saying everything is changed you cannot step into the same river twice and we today have a kind of synthesis between those views we say yes there is change in the world but not any change we have constraints on change why do i think that this is important for physics because unlike mathematics there are mathematical constraints in physics of course but the physical constraints that are not mathematical in my view are constraints on change mathematics doesn't have a notion of change and so i think everything that governs change don't take the metaphor of governing too literally but everything that tells us which changes are possible and which changes are not possible has to do with causation now i know that i'm vulnerable here to a uh, and uh, what Quine used to say, by denying the doctrine, one only changes the subject. So in a way, I change the subject because I'm not talking only about causal relations between events and I want to broaden the picture, but uh, I think I have motivated um, uh, my wish to, to broaden the picture and I'll say more about it in a minute. So examples of constraints, and I want to emphasize that none of them is a priori, we have to check in each theory whether this theory uh, satisfies this constraint and we check it empirically. So we don't impose our constraints, but there are con constraints that we um, that, that have gained uh, our credence and we rely on them and we use them to build new theories. There are symmetries that we use to construct new theories. We trust this symmetry and we think that um, our theory should be generally convariant or we think it should follow some other symmetries, principle of relativity or whatever. So here are some examples of constraints, determinism, locality, and again, I, I emphasize they, they can be disproved. Maybe the fundamental theories are not deterministic. Maybe some theories are, some theories are not. But there are constraints that have been used and that we should consider and that are part of the cluster uh, cluster notion of cause. The other one is locality. We've talked about this in the beginning and yesterday, of course. There are symmetries and conservation laws, which are very important. They are high up in the hierarchy of physics. There's Curie's principle, which tells us that every symmetry in the cause has to be in the effect, but it uses causal notions, we can formulate it in terms of the equations and solutions. We can formulate it in various other ways that do not presuppose a notion of cause. We have in various principles, which are again, very high up in the hierarchy of physics symmetries and in various principles, and there is a connection between them, but we don't go into that. Um, and stability sometimes, not always, it's very important. I think the notion of stability, like the notion of necessity and contingency is very important in human life. Again, I'm not stopping to discuss this notion here, but just remember that when Bohr was struggling to construct a new model of the atom, he had to comply with what we know about atoms that they are very, very stable and the classical model wouldn't give him the stability and therefore he had to assume all kinds of assumptions about stationary state, they do not radiate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So sometimes stability is also a causal constraint. And there are, and these constraints I've dealt with in my book, but there are constraints, there are the constraints that are in any way, I didn't think in the book that I had something very new to say about them. And I was also uh, indecisive about them. And one of them is causal asymmetry. So one reason I didn't want to spend much time on it in the book was that uh, Matthias Frisch has just published a year or two years earlier, a book entirely dedicated to causal asymmetry. And the other reason was that, um, I don't know, I think it's it's too open at the moment. How much of a constraint is it? It's not something that usually uh, would be considered a constraint that would tell us what kind of theory we should construct. It's not like the principle of relativity. It's not like 
least action. It's not like these well-established principles. And yesterday we had, we heard of very recent reasons of why it's not just such a fundamental principle. And there is another interesting principle, and it may even be somehow related to this principle, which is a mutuality of causal action, which means that if here we are talking about events, if, if the cause acts on the effect, the effect also acts on the cause. And you could say this is Newton's third law, but, um, and in that case, it's certainly a causal constraint, but, um, you know, Einstein used it as a justification, uh, even if it was a justification after the fact for justifying dynamical space, space time because he said there was something very unsatisfactory, causally unsatisfactory in Newton theory, because here we, in Newton theory, we have space and space acts on matter because acceleration relative to space has physical meaning, but we don't have matter acting back on space. And in my theory in general relativity, we, we have matter acting back on space. So this restores the symmetry. So this was a line of argument in Einstein in 22, wasn't mentioned in the, um, in 1922, wasn't mentioned in the 1916 paper. Um, so it may be something that occurred to him afterwards, but again, it's a kind of constraint. Some, sometimes it, it, we think, it's a, it's a merit of a theory if it obeys it, but it's not something that fundamental. Okay, so why the causal constraints approach? Why do I prefer it? Although it has this problem of changing the subject somewhat. So first of all, I think this is how scientists think. I think very rarely scientists think about the case of two people con, you know, trying to murder a third one and one punches a, hole in the water flask and the other one put poison in it and then who's responsible etc cetera, etc cetera. this is not the kind of question that worries scientists but scientists want to worry they want to to know about uh, basic symmetries basic invariance laws so i think they are more useful to think about in the context of scientific reasoning there are also historical reasons because if you think of it conservation laws there were ancient ideas about um, not creating anything for ex nihilo, so to speak, and that nothing gets lost back into the void. So there was this idea of conservation. There was um, an idea that the cause equals the effect. So in, in some sense, there was there are historical roots to the idea that conservation laws are uh, causal constraints, and you have people like Meyerson and even Bohr. Bohr, when Bohr talks about uh, um, causality, he actually talks about conservation laws. And again, I won't go into it here, but Elise probably knows because she writes a book or she has written a book on the history of quantum mechanics. And um, other philosophers like Emil Meyerson also think the conservation laws are very, so there are historical reasons. There are, as I said before, causal constraints explain what we do not find, and that's an important function of a causal constraints. But the fourth uh, reason for me, and this does not depend on changing the subject, it's not a semantic issue, um, that this approach of the causal constraints opens a variety of questions about the relations between different constraints. So, um, when we only have one definition of causation and we think that's the definition, etc., we don't think very much about the other definition. But when we see that we really have a family of several constraints and some perhaps are more fundamental than others, some perhaps are reducible to others, um, some perhaps we tend to confuse and we shouldn't, um, then there is a lot of work to do. So some of these relations are well known. For example, um, symmetries and conservation laws are related. It was already, um, people became aware of it in the course of the development of classical mechanics. And then of course, there are the important theorems of Amy Nutter. So symmetries and conservation laws are closely related. This is well known. There are other cases, there are things that 
we 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 seem or conceive of as very closely related, and they're not so closely related. For example, determinism and necessity, or determinism and stability, or again in more everyday uh, talk, determinism and fatalism. There is a big difference of whether one event is very stable and no matter where you start, you're going to get to it or whether we just have determinism. Um, and there is another option. Of, so we want to disentangle determinism and necessity and stability. Uh, we also, this is also a, a nice um, case where we should disentangle notions Again, in the philosophical literature, you have a, a definition of causation in terms of actually determinism. Uh, but then there is a competing definition in terms of intervention, right? Causal model theories are based on this idea of intervention. Now, when you think of it, when does determinism apply? Determinism only applies in a closed system. An intervention is always an intervention from without. So actually there is a tension between causation as intervention or as manifesting itself in a case of intervention and determinism where you have a closed system and once the initial conditions are given, nothing can change. And so when you think about the different uh, members of this family of causal constraints, you can, you can be more sensitive to these differences. And there are cases, and here we get to quantum mechanics, where there is really a very uh, fascinating dance between different constraints and a dance or payoff relation that was not evident from the beginning. And if we go back to the EPR situation that we started from, which gave rise to the idea of entanglement, here we have a very peculiar payoff relation between determinism and locality. Because it turns out that the reason we can comply with a no signaling constraint that gives us compatibility with special relativity is that Neither Alice nor Bob can predict the results of the measurement with certainty. So it's because when they look at what they do, they cannot infer with certainty what the result at the other end was that there is no signaling. Because if there was determinism, they could have used the correlation that they know of in order to signal. So here we have an example of, if you think of it, location is what, locality is one constraint, and it talks about how causal inference spreads in space time, it should be continuous, etc., and it should take time. And determinism is something else. It tells us that if we have the same system again, it will develop exactly in the same trajectory. And on the face of it, we don't see the relation between the two. And in classical physics, it's not clear how this relationship works. But in classic, classic, in quantum mechanics, it's a very intricate relation. So we can now go back. And we may discuss several questions. And I want to say something about the last of these. And so these are not. We don't have to discuss them, but these are just suggestions for what we could discuss. So I asked Elise yesterday, and, and, and I would like to hear more about it, how she characterizes her view vis-a-vis -vis these other views that claim there is no causal direction on the fundamental level of physics. In particular, there is no causal um, asymmetry um, at the level of quantum mechanics. So we, we, if and where uh, this view differs, because the metaphysical part of the talk, I wasn't so sure that I'm uh, following the, the point where you think 
these uh, new results really um, make a difference to what the other people who said there there's no causal order, no temporal order on the fundamental le level. I couldn't. I wasn't sure that I see the exact difference between your uh, conclusions from the experiments and from the theorems you uh, uh, reported and um, the point you were trying to make. The other question, which we didn't discuss yesterday, but you mentioned at least the uh, possibility of an epistemic interpretation of what we see. And I wanted you perhaps, if, if you'd like, to expand a little bit on that. Would it make a difference? What kind of difference would it, would it make? Epistemic interpretations of quantum mechanics are quite influential. And um, I wonder whether you want to say a bit more about it. I, I know you mentioned it yesterday. The third one is whether free will is a particularly problematic for um, any view. I, here I wrote retrocausation, but in general, for every view that allows an influence from the future to the past. <laughs> I deleted apparently question number four because we started to discuss it yesterday. And so um, the last question to me is uh, the most troubling one. And I want to say something about it. And the question is, how does causal order emerge on higher levels? Because we agree that on higher levels, we do see, I suppose you would agree to that. Um, we do see temporal order and we do, or, or we seem to see, we have an impression of temporal order and of causal order. And we want to know, if not how they actually emerge, how our impression has been formed and has, been, has become so stable that we say, well, it's our intuition or whatever. It has become a very stable kind of thinking that something like that exists on higher levels. And why do I think it's a big question? Because we don't know as yet very much about the relationship between quantum mechanics and the higher level of physics. Like, let's say fun, quantum mechanics is the fundamental theory. Let's forget for a minute about general relativity. Or whatever. Let's say quantum mechanics is the fundamental level. On the fundamental level, there is no causal order. There's no temporal order. How does it emerge? So I'm not talking about why entanglement disappears in the classical world, because there is a good question to that. And you mentioned it yesterday, and your work is some of your work uh, um, goes into decoherence in great depth. So decoherence explains to us why we don't see superposition in the macro world, and that's fine. But this is not my question because causal order, causal asymmetry and temporal order um, somehow emerge again, either in reality or in our, our perception of reality, and we want to know how that happens. And that brings us back to the era of time, thermodynamics, and answer to that answers to that question. And I think um, sometimes there are good arguments, but very often there is a lot of hand waving. We live in the macro world, and here the, the second law of thermodynamics applies. Well, we know that's not enough. So we say, yes, but our universe is such that the initial conditions were such, and we are the result of this branch, we're sitting on that branch that started with uh, these particular initial conditions. And I, again, I'm not sure this is a very satisfactory answer and that it really explains the mixing of coffee and milk, as we say, um, in our cappuccino. So, what am I looking for? Why am I dissatisfied? I want to give one example that to me is a paradigm of a wonderful case. And that's Feynman's derivation. And with that, I would conclude. It's my, my last point. And, and this is the kind of idea that I want to set for explaining the relationship between quantum mechanics or the fundamental level where there is no causal order and the higher levels where there is a causal order. 
So Feynman succeeded to recover in recovering the principle of least action from his picture of quantum mechanics. And if you think of it, there is something very surprising about that because the principle of least action, and I said at the beginning, variation principles are very important in physics. So they are very, very high up in the hierarchy of causal constraints. But the principle of least action and its likes is a very strange principle, if you think it, of it, because Newtonian mechanics is okay, right? Every particle, every, every mechanical object gets instructions every minute. And these instructions determine how it would move. But a principle like uh, the principle of least action seems very teleological, right? Because how can a system pick a particular path that at each point satisfies a constraint of economy or minimal value to a certain integral? It seems that it has to have the end point in view and choose a path that does something. And this, this is ridiculous. This is completely teleological. And we, we want to get rid of this kind of formulation in physics, right? So, okay, then people prove that the principle of least action and the formulation of classical mechanics in terms of Newtonian differential equation are equations are equivalent and we can view it as either completely causal, a la Newton, or um, teleological with the principle of least action since they are equivalent, we don't have to place too much weight on either of these perspectives. Um, the causalist will say that the ideological explanation is a superstructure on the causal explanation. And if some, someone likes teleological explanation, you would, could, could reverse the picture and say that the causal structure is a superstructure on the teleological structure. Fine. But then comes quantum mechanics, and it's all probabilities, certainly according to Feynman. How can we recover the principle of least action with this teleological appearance from the underlying chaotic reality of quantum mechanics? And Feynman managed to do it. And there is a calculation, there is a derivation. He had a, a, a hint from Dirac as to how to define action in quantum mechanics. What is the analog of classical action in quantum mechanics? Uh, we, he was looking for it for a long time. Then he got this hint from a student who came over from Europe and told him about it. And within hours, as they say, this is a story, he derived the Schrodinger equation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he, he formulated quantum mechanics in Lagrangian terms and in terms of the principle of least action, which was which was his favorite formulation, anyway, even in work that he did before. So this, for me, is a model of deriving something macroscopic and curious and inexplicable on the face of it in quantum terms and to derive it from the underlying uh, reality of quantum mechanics. So what I would like to see, not that I'm hoping for one of us to do it tonight, but, but I think this is a model that would not be just hand waving. We sit here in the macroscopic world. Yes, we sit in the macroscopic world. Well, what if a relation? We have to find some continuity between this fundamental level at which there is no causal order and the higher levels on which there is. So any of these points or other points that you want to react, react to, Elise, I'd be delighted. Well, thank you so much, Yamima. Um, there's just so much goodness there. Um, I wrote notes and notes and notes while you were speaking. So I'll, I will say very briefly and then um, sort of respond to a couple things and then let others weigh in and we can see where the discussion goes, what people find most interesting. Um, but the first thing I want to say is that I find your definition of causality as a constraint on change to be, I think, among the most robust definitions I've encountered where causality is not at the fundamental level. Indeed, constraints are not 
they're sort of meta properties, right? They're properties about how properties can be. Uh, and I find it extraordinarily helpful. Um, and so I really like it. But what I think indefinite causal ordering um, experiments are doing is putting to test what happens when we drop a sort of our, um, what we assume to be the correct constraints for the ordering loosely ordered uh, the loose ordering of certain events or certain operations. And what they find is actual fruit, right? Not just that, not just um, greater efficiency in quantum computation, perhaps, um, but there's also a suggestion that it may guide how we think about quantization of gravity um, by thinking about these things. So in a way, um, somebody had asked yesterday, I think it was Ferd, Ferd, um, or, or, or maybe it was Peter, how I moved from decoherence to this. Well, decoherence is exactly the rich studies that come out of that are based on realizing that the, we only do quantum mechanics in the first place, as you said, Yamima, by invoking certain assumptions or idealizations about the closedness and isolatedness of the system of interest that we can carve the world up in certain ways and this is the apparatus and this is the system of interest and there's the environment and we can neglect the environment and so on and we can pretend that schrodinger's equation really univocally evolves right and unitarily right univocally and unitarily so there's deterministic aspects there um but that's you know that's not true anytime you have an interaction you have uh non-unitary uh terms introduced right so I think um, even if I agree with you totally, which I do about this definition of causation, there's there's two things. The one is that, well, one of the arguments for um, maintaining a robust understanding of causality at higher levels, and I, I take it that you said you disagree that there, that there is no causal principle, you think, right? No universal causal principle. I think we agree about that. That seems pretty clear. The question then is, okay, how do how do we get usefulness for the clearly useful, clearly fruitful, higher level concepts? Um, but at the same time, the fact that it is by dropping the concept of causality, by dropping a, a presupposed background dependence um, on a particular structure. Um, so for instance, change right change requires that you parse up a phase space in a certain way and look at how the system moves through contiguous cells in that phase space so ico i take it um people investigating this are trying to develop theories that do not presuppose any parsing of phase space or any parsing of that space so they still measure change but the change they're measuring is sort of um relative it isn't an ultimate, it isn't based in some structure of the world that's truly causal or has true different space time points, which is exactly what Einstein, as you mentioned, why he rejected Newton's um, absolute uh, space time cathedral, right? The, or the theater in which these events happened. He wanted to drop that absolute background uh, and let the laws of physics sort of uh, work within that. And um, I think that that's a similar question here. So that's the first thing is that thinking about causal constraints could be useful, um, but also how we can get around those constraints or untether the way those constraints um, are moored to particular parsings of space and time, because that's where we get change, um, could be very fruitful too. Uh, so that's that, that point. And then I will end with a, a metaphysical point, which is, again, constraints. Um, they can't be primitive, can they? I mean, are constraints a brute fact of the world? It seems they couldn't be because we have counterexamples like spontaneous symmetry breaking or, I don't know, uh, parity, failure, and beta decay. Um, it seems that our symmetries, and there's a lot of literature about this, which I'm not totally um, up on, and you may be, but symmetry isn't going to be our guiding light either. Um, and there is something under they are or they are not sorry they are going to be or they are not going to be they, can be. they cannot be i think 
because of these counterexamples. So they are very useful heuristics. They are very important for modeling and even for developing new theories. But if we, but they're they're useful as guides, but problematic as dogma, one might say. If you were talking about what does the world really look like, I think constraints you either have to accept them as a brute fact, the world just is the way that such that momentum is conserved, or you say. Uh, there's something deeper going on. And in this way, maybe maybe the debate here is a little bit like Brown and Pooley and others with their Lorentzian pedagogy. It's like, what do you count as a brute fact? Is it Lorentzian variance that's a brute fact of the universe or is it the way the metric is? Uh, and the sort of explanatory story you tell about how physics, um, how the other theories sort of rely on that under that um, underpinning depends on what you want to accept as a brute fact in your in your metaphysic. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and and I want to think a lot more about the retro causality thing. I hadn't yet. Um, I, I had taken Hugh's work to be sort of um, not not directly targeting the asymmetry. But if he is targeting the asymmetry argument, then I am clearly aligned in some ways with what he's up to. So I will have to take a deeper dive into that literature. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so yeah. much. Um, Can so I have a quick sure, one? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I, I try to make it clear that I don't see any of these as dogma in a dogmatic way. I see, I don't see any of these as a priori. I think our, our notion of the, our, our knowledge of the world develops and our uh, notions, our explanatory notions develop with it. We didn't, we didn't have a notion like general covariance before, gener before Einstein and general theory of relativity. And then we had this notion. And what is beneficial, so, so I'm not dogmat dogmatic a bit about any of these. And of course we learned that some laws do not apply. And if you only think about the history of the conservation uh, of energy, so we thought it was mass and then uh, developing and we don't know now what is dark matter and Priya can tell us more about it. So we don't know where conservation of mass energy would lead us in the future. These are open things in our, I, it's an open texture. Science is an open texture and our, our causal notions are open texture and perhaps we'll drop some of the constraints. Perhaps we have dropped determinism. I mentioned determinism, but it's not that I think that determinism is still an accepted constraint. So sometimes we benefit from adding constraints, like when Einstein said, I don't like it that, that matter doesn't act back on space. Let me add this constraint, it should act back. And then he has dynamical space time and background independence and wonderful. So he added the constraint or general covariance. On the other hand, we gain a lot from dropping constraints like dropping determinism. Some people say drop compatibility with special relativity, whatever. So it can work in either way. And the last thing I wanted is to, to be dogmatic about it. But if, to the contrary, I want to say there is no one definition of causation that a philosopher can give. It's the way science develops that tells us. Now, whether it's a brute fact, I don't know what brute facts are unless you want individual facts. There is the, what, what they call in philosophy, human supervenience. All there is in the world are the facts. And then there are our, our most economical ways of summarizing these facts, summarizing up these facts. I'm not sure that all laws of nature like uh, conservation of energy, for example, although it is, as I said, the, the future of this law is open. Um, I don't think we understand them as a summary of what happened. We want to say, don't invest in building a perpetual mobile machine. It won't, it won't work. There is some kind of stronger necessity than just a summary of the facts. Um, so so I, I think constraints, are viewed by us in a different way than facts, but it doesn't mean that they're not fundamental. I don't know of anything more fundamental in physics than some basic symmetries, but it's all defeasible. Tomorrow we may prove wrong. Okay, Great. yeah. I'm sorry if I suggested that you were being dogmatic. I think I was sort of imagining metaphysic uh, metaphysicians who would take your project on board uh, and want to motivate like a robust sense of causality higher up and deny fundamental causality. Mm -hmm. 
that they yeah. end up sort of reifying that causal constraint notion. Mm -hmm. But mm. yeah, exactly. And, and I think I said this yesterday too. I mean, you're very clear in the book. Uh, by the way, pick it up, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for the promotion. <laughs> um, but but that you're not primarily asking metaphysical questions uh, of this sort. But clearly, you and I are both interested in the emergence kind of question and where that emergence begins and where it ends, well, where it ends is obvious, it's at the observable, right? But where it begins will matter on your metaphysical construal of things to some extent, I might I might think. It does for me well, anyway. Why, I, I can't separate metaphysics from science that much, certainly not when I'm not thinking about ethics, but about causation. I think we learn from science what the world is like. And I don't think that I have some other means, some access to a metaphysics which I can judge whether it's right or not to help me understand science. I think it should be bottom up. I should look at what science does and see whether it makes sense in some more general way that you could learn, that you, that you would count or that other people have counted as metaphysics. Causation usually in philosophy belongs to metaphysics, but to me it belongs to philosophy of science. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> so um, well, that was that was wonderful. Um, there are a couple of questions that uh, we have from the audience. And one is from Jen Geary, who asks, would degradation of signal to noise be another example of a constraint? That's how the quantum switch folks do their work. It is exactly, I saw that in the chat, Jen, that's exactly spot on. Um, they are thinking about signal to noise constraints in a particular way here. I need to understand better how that works, but uh, Yamima, is that something you encountered in your research for the book? No, and um, it's, in what sense is it a constraint? You want to limit it, no? It's something that you want to reduce it's a pragmatic, is it a pragmatic ideal to reduce? It's, or... it's sorry, I can let the, I, yeah, Jen, if you want to answer that, you probably do a better job than I can. <laughs> oh, in cybernetics, I see. Um, well, noise is, I mean, it's related to the, the, the fidelity of the qubit in some, or the, 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 the cleanliness of the quantum I mean, it has to do with information, like what, what do you, how do you parse information right yeah 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 you can think of the the ico which is being about establishing various quantum channels and quantum channels is all about signal to noise ratios as far as i understand mm. so um, so what what would the constraint look like and can i um that we should reduce the entropy or the loss of information to a certain degree and that quantum channels are more efficient than classical channels in that, in doing that or? Uh, let me see if I can remember. Um, it's, it, it has to do on how they calculate the upper and lower bounds for their, uh, for that process matrix, um, the, the causal witness. So it's packaged right in at the front, and that's part of why I want to dig into this more, because the physics in this case is not very clearly telling us what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's how they how they um, measure the noise to signal ratio has to gives them allows them to set those bounds on when the process uh, when the when the causal witness is witnessing um, a, a group of events that are separable causally or non-separable causally. So their whole definition of separability or entanglement, as it were, non-separability entanglement is based in the signal to noise measure. I see. So I think Jen follows up with another question. So in law, human actors perform acts without thoughtful action or intention. Well, I knew this one about free will was coming. What might be the connection between this precept and free will? Uh, well, I think we both wanted to, to leave open the fact that there are robust and genuinely not just useful, but explanatorily weighty and maybe even predictive notions of causality that emerge in, for instance, biology, evolutionary biology or what have you. Um, 
But yeah, I guess if you're, it, there is some notion of reduction implied if you want to understand what it, what the basic behavior of the smallest bits and bops are, um, then it seems that you do have to, I, I have assumed a quantum fundamentalism and that's, that I should, yeah, I should be clear. Like that's, that is an assumption. I think I'm in good company in making that assumption. But that's a different yeah, you are You are in good company, but I, I, I'm not in that company. Can I say something about that? Yes, please. Just a thought. Yes. There's a difference between the quantum phenomena and the current somewhat confused understanding of the quantum phenomena. The anomalies in that understanding are not essentially anomalies in quantum phenomena. So you have a lot of theoreticians talking about quantum phenomena in different ways. And some of the anomalies in theory are anomalies in talk about quanta, not talk about, not the phenomena, not the quanta themselves. So you're presuming to overcome, to offset, to sabotage some classical ideas of, of causality as energy transfer, for example, just on the basis of ideas in quantum theory, which explain experiments that are incompletely understood. So an incomplete understanding of quantum phenomena is producing ideas of causality that offset or undermine ideas of, of causality, which seem fairly well grounded in thermodynamics or biology. Yeah, yeah well, no, I, I disagree with that. <laughs> empirical evidence. I mean, for instance, the first ICO switch test that was done by Potiato, like they developed a, a system for doing a computation that was more effective when they built it this way than the other. So there's that cries out to me as a philosopher says there's something here worth explaining. Whether it turns out that it's an anomaly or not is further. But Yamima, sorry, you you have been waiting patiently. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, well, I certainly don't want to uh, throw away robust causal notions in the classical level. On to the contrary, I think. Um, my constraints work well in classical physics, but many of them, even if not the causal order, as I emphasized, that I'm, I'm willing to be open-minded about the causal order with re, in, in view of these new experiments, but there are more symmetries and conservation laws in quantum mechanics than in classical mechanics. So I think in, in this sense, some of the constraints are satisfied in quantum mechanics. So I don't think quantum mechanics is an a causal theory or theory which has no causality. Maybe, then this is what, what uh, at least uh, uh, a question at least opened our eyes to, uh, maybe there's no causal order there. But then the most more important question is reduction. I'm not a reductionist. I think in order to have reduction, we have to translate the laws of the higher level into the laws of the lower level and the concept of the higher level into the concept of the lower level. And the idea is that once we do that, everything will be explained, but it doesn't work that way because we learned that very often, a lot of the properties of the higher level are completely insensitive to things on the lower level. And therefore, it is preferable to use properties and concepts of the higher level to explain phenomena that happen on the higher level. So I'm not a reductionist. And this is also related to the problem of free will because in order to have an explanatory law, we have to explain the explanandum, that is the, the um, phenomena that we want to explain. We have to describe it in a way that matches the description in the law, right? If we want to explain the, why this boat has sunk, we have to use the way that it can carry and the way that was put on it, and it will help us understand why it couldn't float. But the name of the, of the captain and the shirt he had on that day won't help us, right? So we have to have the right description. And I think that um, a lot of the properties that we need for mental activity are not physical properties. Physics has nothing to say about all the people, the group of people whose name begins with a B. It's not a natural kind. So we cannot expect that physics will have something to say about that group of people in the way it has something to say about electrons. And in the same sense, I don't think that physics can say 
something about all the things in the world that can be frightening, say. There is nothing common in physical terms to all the frightening things. So I think um, even in a deterministic world, there is some sense of freedom in the sense that we cannot explain and therefore we cannot predict our actions because the description of the action doesn't match any natural kind that a law of physics can be hooked to or hooked onto. And it's the very limited sense of freedom, and I think it may connect well with what you said, but even in this limited sense um, is, is um, consoling because it can even be realized in a deterministic world. And we don't know that our world is deterministic, but even in a deterministic world, we can have that kind of non-reductionism and freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there's a question from Jenny Wagner, another of our regular um, seminar attendees. Uh, and she asked to question number two, how do you interpret the poly exclusion principle as a causal constraint? Can two electrons never actually be in the same state ontologically? For me, I would be cautious and say that this should only be interpreted epistemically because we can never prove this exclusion principle. So should we treat possible and impossible constraints in different ways? Thank you very much for this question. I suppose it's to me. Yeah. 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 Okay, so Pauli's principle is really an interesting principle because in its mature formulation, it's just a mathematical principle, right? The wave function of this combination has to be anti-symmetric and from that everything else follows about fermions in general. And I had a big argument with a very dear colleague of mine who died at the beginning of the pandemic of, of COVID virus. Um, and he said, um, Pauli's principle is a, a demonstration that purely mathematical principles do work for us in physics. But I looked a little more into the history of the principle and its applications, not so much the history, but the application of the principle. So there was a very nice application of the principle early on in 31, 32, I don't remember exactly, by Chandra Sekau, um, who calculated um, the mass of a white dwarf, the limited mass beyond which it would collapse under its own gravity. And so there is gravity pulling inside and what is a force that pulls outside? And it's really the result of Pauli's, Pauli's exclusion principle. And only when gravity overcomes that pressure towards the periphery, um, when gravity overcomes it and pulls the mass back, then, then we, we have the collapse. And the limit it reached, which I think is around 1.4 of the mass of the sun, is still very much, uh, Priya, is it still accepted? Yeah, very much there. I mean, and the degenerative okay. pressure is a real thing. And also, you know, in the laboratory, when they make Bose-Einstein condensates, they are taking advantage of the degeneracy pressure that you get. So these new states of matter and stuff, right? Okay, so, so in that sense here, it works like a causal principle because it's something that balances gravity. So gravity, again, is very abstract and, and Pauli's principle is very abstract, but it's, the, the applications of these principles are applications to very concrete things. And then later, many years later, when, when they proved the mature form of the theory and they had to prove it, they used what they call the microcausality. That is a relativistic, special relativistic principle that um, parallel or analogous to no signaling. So again, a causal principle went into the proof of the theory. So even if um, electron for us and other fermions certainly don't have an identity and we, co we, <laughs> we cannot uh, um, track them and find them in a certain place and say the other one cannot get into this place, um, the way the principle work, works and is applied is, I think, uh, in harmony with I considering it a cause of principle, a symmetry, an anti-symmetry to cause a constraint. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. That was uh, very nice. And that was a great example, actually. Um, very impressive. In your area. I'm so glad. I was going to say, I was very impressed that you remembered uh, 1.4 <laughs> solar masses. Uh, that, was, uh, that was great. <laughs> so um, are there any um, other questions? If not, you know, I'd like to close with one question myself. And I think that, you know, um, I wonder, you know, when we talk about um, determinism and we talk about reductionism, I often have a difficulty trying to see how they sit conceptually with like the essential sort of provisional nature of science and that I know that the provisionality, so what, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, the provisionality of science, what is knowable in nature has two kinds of limits, right? So there may be limits that are intrinsic to nature itself, that maybe it's not knowable beyond whatever, right? And the other is our own kind of cognitive limitations and tools and capacities, right? So, I was wondering how our notions of reductionism and provisionality kind of, I mean, do they collide or do you see them, you know, how do you both see them? I would love to hear a little bit more about how to think about them because these are sort of conceptually, I, I struggle with them actually, have to confess. Where exactly do you see the connection? Why should someone's position on determinism dictate position on reduction? Because I, 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 as I said, I, I think we don't have to be reductionists. Well, I think it because they, they, they conflate at the point of prediction, right? Uh, about what kind of predictions therefore you can make for future behavior of systems. So if you have a deterministic system, then you, know, you are able to predict fairly well, although limited with current limits of you know, how, much you, how much is knowable, right? Yeah. And, um, reductionism is, I, I see the way reductionism matters is there is a way in which you can map one system or one set of problems onto another one, which is predictable, which was deterministic, even though this particular one might not be, right? I'm trying to search for a concrete example, but um, I'm not as um, sharp on the fly as you are, Yamila, to yeah. come up with a problem that would really yeah. illustrate this. Um, well, that's, I think it's related to models when, when you take one area as a model for another area. And um, as I say, determinism only applies under very strict conditions of closed systems. And, um, and even if Determinism holds in the classical world, you know, the argument that it doesn't even hold in the classical, classical world. world right. Yeah, like Norton and Ehrman have given examples, but I think the examples are very far out and we don't have to take them too much into account. So let's say for us, the world is deterministic and then we learn that there is a more fundamental level of quantum mechanics, which isn't, then again, I think it's our methodological drive is to explain how what we see is compatible with what we know about the fundamental level. And that in some cases we succeed, in some cases we do not, you know, phase transitions. It's such a complex area. We're trying to figure out these phase transitions from what we know about the fundamental level. And we learn a lot of curious things about analogies between different materials that behave in similar similar ways although there is it's not the same mechanism mm -hmm. magnetization is not the same mechanism as condensation but there are it's a similar mathematical structure and similar fixed points mm 
And so it's not a reduction to the mechanisms of the fundamental level at all. Mm. I'm not a reduction. Mm. And determinism, I don't, I don't think I have to answer those questions together. Determinism is a different issue for sure. me than yeah. reduction. Mm. Elise, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, it's, um, I, I agree with what Yamima says, um, but maybe from a slightly different perspective. I mean, the way I could maybe understand reduction and determinism is the same as that they're about establishing a particular kind of relationship between two relata, a before and after or cause effect relationship in the case of determinism or a higher order, lower order for reduction. Um, but my PhD thesis was all about if this depends on a well-defined well relata, then you don't get there are no well-defined relata um, unless you're assuming closed, isolated systems. systems. Uh, and this becomes exacerbated at large levels. And this is why you get, uh, maybe as James Ladyman has said, like you get maybe an ontology for biology that's appropriate to that field of study and that um, genuinely explains uh, and uh, so on, but it doesn't reduce to quantum mechanics. Yeah, yeah it, it's not translatable to quantum. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, last questions from the um, audience. I don't see um, any, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, both Yamima and Elise for wonderful uh, session today and for a really nice lecture yesterday. It was a real treat and um, I personally could have had this go on um, longer <laughs> and longer and hang on to both of you mm -hmm. and kind of uh, mm -hmm. ask uh, many more uh, questions. Um, you know, it's really remarkable how sharp and clear your understanding is for both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, a real pleasure. And thank you, Elisa. I'm so glad we met at this very nice opportunity. Yeah, and I hope you, Mima, and um, we, are, we are hoping to have a workshop next year, hopefully, the virus permitting, <laughs> we, well, hopefully we will see you in New Haven, so. Oh, and, wonderful, and, thank you very much, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and I uh, just want to say thanks to Ty and to Guy and for our audience uh, for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.